So far I've suggested that all closure data types are immutable, but this is actually not the case. There are a few key exceptions. One of those exceptions is called a var. A var is a mutable reference, that is, it's basically an object which is a pointer to another object. You can think of it kind of being like a collection of one, and a mutable collection, so you can change what it is a var points to. A namespace enclosure you can think of as like a kind of collection. It's an associative collection that maps symbol keys to values which are vars. Each namespace is known by its name, and these names must be unique to uniquely identify that namespace, so effectively the namespaces all live in one global namespace. By which I don't mean a namespace object, I just mean in the abstract sense. So say in our program we might have two namespaces, one named cat, one named dog, and then in the namespace cat we can have a single symbol var mapping of the symbol mittens mapped to, the, to some var object, and then in our namespace dog we have three mappings. We have a mapping of spot to some var, rover to some var, and spike to some var. So this is how code is organized in Clojure. You write a function, you assign it to a var, that var gets mapped to some symbol in some namespace, and that's how it's found. You may be thinking here that the vars in the namespaces are an unnecessary level of indirection, I mean, because you can simply have namespaces map symbols to other objects, like, say, directly to functions, but there are actually good reasons for it being this way, which will become evident as we go on. In any programming language, there's this phase of compilation or interpretation where the source code has to be converted from text into some kind of data so that this data can then be analyzed and interpreted or compiled. Usually this process is called lexing and parsing, and what gets spit out at the other end is what's called the AST, or Abstract Syntax Tree. The idea is that when you write your compiler, you don't want to have to deal with it in terms of text because it's really unwieldy. You want it in terms of a neatly navigable tree of objects where, say, you have an object representing a function, and that function is made up, say, of a list of parameters and a list of statement objects, which are in turn themselves made up of other statement objects or maybe other expression objects and so forth. Well, in Lisp, of course, you have to do this lexing and parsing just like in any other language, but in Lisp, the code that does this is called the reader. What makes the reader unique from the typical lexers and parsers of other languages is that instead of spitting out an abstract syntax tree, instead what the reader spits out is simply made up of the ordinary types in the language, that is things like uh, strings, numbers, lists, vectors, symbols, and so forth. In fact, a good way to think about it is that the syntax of Lisp is made entirely of literals. You have literals for numbers, literals for strings, and literals for symbols, and then you also have literals for lists, and vectors, and maps, and so forth. So for instance, here are two examples. In this top example, when the text is read in by the reader, what it returns is a vector object composed of first a number negative four, followed by the string hello. And then when the reader reads the text in the bottom example, what it returns is a list composed of first a symbol foo, and then the number three, the number five, and then another list, which has nothing in it but just another symbol bar. So the way the reader does its business is say it's reading a source file and it starts at the top, and as soon as it reads a complete literal, what it then does is it passes that object off to a second stage called the evaluator. And it's the evaluator which looks at this data structure and translates it into action. And this process goes back and forth. First the reader starts at the top, it reads as much as it needs to get a complete object, it passes off to the evaluator, the evaluator does its business, and then the reader resumes, gets the next complete object, and passes it to the evaluator, which completes, and then the reader does its business again. So it goes reader, evaluator, reader, evaluator, back and forth. So the question is, when the evaluator looks at the data from the reader, what does it do when it traverses that data? Well, one thing that happens is that the symbols have to be resolved into vars. So say the evaluator sees the symbol rabbit, what it does is it looks in the current namespace for the symbol rabbit and sees what var it maps to, and that's the var which the, the symbol resolves into. Now when I say current namespace, what do I mean? Well, at any moment in time, there is one namespace which is chosen to be the current one. You, there's a function in the standard library which you use to set what the current namespace is. At any one time, there's only one. So if I have two namespaces, dog and cat, at any moment in time, one of those is going to be my current namespace. There's a special rule for symbols containing forward slashes, such as here, pig slash rabbit. 
pig slash rabbit is going to resolve to the var mapped to the symbol rabbit in the namespace pig. So symbols evaluate into vars, but lists evaluate into function calls. So here we have a list starting with the symbol falcon, and then the numbers 8, 2, and the string goodbye. The first item in the list is the specifier of the function, and the remaining items are all of the arguments to that function. So what should happen here is that falcon resolves in the current namespace to a var, and that var should contain a function, and so this becomes a call to that function, with the arguments 8, 2, and the string goodbye. And those basically are our two core evaluation rules. Symbols evaluate into vars, lists evaluate into function calls. Everything else just stays as it is. So here another example, iguana slash hippo resolves to the var mapped to the symbol hippo in the namespace iguana, and that var should contain a function. That function is called with the arguments of a vector containing two items, nil and three, and the second argument to hippo is the value returned by the call to kangaroo. The function in the var map to the symbol kangaroo here is called with no arguments. The symbol and list evaluation rules are almost by themselves enough for a complete language, but they're not quite. What we need in addition are what Lisp calls special forms. A special form is a reserved symbol that denotes a special kind of list evaluation. It's a break of the normal rules. It's not a function call, it's something else. In closure, the special form symbols are def, if, do, let, quote, var, fn, loop, recur, throw, try, dot, new, and set exclamation mark. If a list begins with any of these symbols, that list is evaluated in a special way particular to that special form. So a list beginning with do is evaluated in a different way from a list beginning with let. One essential special form we need is if, which allows us to have code which is executed only conditionally. As you can see, if takes three forms, or as we can just say, arguments, the first of which is a condition, the second is some expression A, and the third, some expression B. Uh, the question mark here indicates that the B is optional, you can leave it out. So when an if is executed, the condition expression returns either true or false, and if it's true, then the expression A is going to be executed and returned, otherwise the expression B is going to be executed and returned. Either it's going to be A or it's going to be B, never both. Remember earlier when I said that if in a functional language is a function-like construct in the sense that it returns a value. So what happens here is that if we execute A, we return the value from A, and if we execute B, then we return that value. So an if is itself a kind of expression. It can be used as an argument to other functions and so forth. So here in this top example, we call vulture, and if it returns true, then we execute foo and return that value. Otherwise, if vulture returns false, then we execute bar and return that value. In the bottom example, we call the function ostrich, and if it returns true, then the if returns the value of the string yo, otherwise it will return the value nil, because that's what the default is. We don't have an expression b, so we just return nil.